Hi guys, and welcome to the new Objectivist Girl live show. This will be premiering normally live at 6 p.m. on Fridays, uh, right before Free Talk Live, so make sure that you tune in. But we're pre-recording this one because next week I'm going to be at the Atlas Summit. So today I'm here with Kathy Reisenwood. Say hi, Kathy! Thanks for having me, Lauren. Of course! So Kathy and I are here to talk about the hashtag and Father's Day thing. Um, I think it's a little crazy, and you know what? Everybody's blaming it on the feminists. I hear there are fake Facebooks. They hear all of this nonsense. So Kathy, do you want to fill us in on this? Yeah, absolutely, but I just want to preface by saying, y'all got trolled. You got trolled really hard. <laughs> <laughs> This began at the place that most troll, you know, successful trolls begin, uh, 4chan. And uh, it was a bunch of MRAs who wanted to stir some shit up and, uh, and blame it on feminists. And the sad thing is, even though looking at it, it's pretty clearly satire, um, a lot of people believed it because they have some really crazy assumptions about feminism. So, uh, you know, and as it got going, I'm sure people who really believe crazy shit got on board. I mean, I can't get into the hearts and minds of every person who used the hashtag, but this is a troll. Um, this is satire. And uh, and I think it's really, you know, it's a really good teaching moment, so I'm really glad that you had me on to kind of talk about it. Yeah. Because what I really want to get into is how, um, you know, on the same, well, I think it was the same day, there was a, a Salon article about Adam Kokesh and took his comments about the, um, you know, the cop killers, and... Oh my gosh, could you believe his comments about that? Well, I mean, you know, people get taken out of context and everything like that, but the point is, it's the same thing. Every time Salon takes, you know, the most fringe, or not fringe, but I guess um, out there of our, you know, public speakers, of libertarians public speakers, and then takes them out of context, you can make people sound, and you can make an entire movement sound really fucking crazy. And in every movement, you're going to have people who push the envelope and who say some things that seem a little crazy. And just like it's really stupid for people to take Salon's account of libertarianism as accurate of representing libertarianism, it's really stupid for libertarians to take MRA trolls accounts of feminism as now, representative of feminism. Can, can you tell us what MRAs are? Just, just to... Oh like, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, it stands for men's rights activists. Men's rights yeah. activists? Yeah, and I mean... J MRAs have kind of a similar problem where you have a lot of MRAs. This came up with the whole Elliot Rogers situation where people, you know, he was very, very active on MRA forums. You can find his username, like you can find videos and photos. This is documented. He was heavily involved in the MRA community. And if you delve not very deep into the MRA community, you're going to find some crazy ass shit, uh, kind of Elliot Roger light shit, some misogyny, some rape apology, some rape fantasies, um, just really nasty stuff. Now, you know, that doesn't discredit the legitimate issues that MRAs bring up. There are some real ways that men have their rights violated that women don't. Um, and so I think, you know, for MRAs, they should be especially wary of someone taking their most vile, most insane, most fringe representations and putting that as, as, as using it to discredit the whole movement. Yeah. So do you think that, or, or, or is that like your opposing group, the MRAs? I mean, <laughs> like the anti no. Yeah, well, you know, you've got feminists and we're just trying to uh, end sexism, but MRAs generally describe themselves as anti-feminist. So it's not that feminists are anti-MRA, but MRAs are anti-feminist. Now, Kathy, is there any credence to the idea that maybe feminist movements make people let, like turn against uh, the female gender? Like, like movements against racism cause more racism? So it just kind of brings it into the spotlight 
And um, instead of putting it in the background, like personally, I would ignore race movements and all those other things and not do them just because I think the less that we talk about it and the less you bring it up, the better. I've not encountered a problem that can be solved by ignoring it. Um, I, I don't generally ascribe to that. I wish that racism and sexism would just go away. Um, and I think that we're, we're making progress. I think that material prosperity, um, and actually this has been borne out through data, that the, you know, the more prosperous and, and more educated people are generally less bigoted. Um, and so I definitely want to work toward material prosperity. But I also think that bigotry, sexism, and racism, and transphobia, and homophobia hold back material prosperity. So it's almost like you have, I think, you're most effective when you battle both. And that one of the ways that you battle both is to bring it up and say, hey, you know, you're making these assumptions that you're not even aware that you're making, and they're pernicious, and so maybe examine them. Um, and that's the way I go about it. That's interesting. Um, so, um, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out exactly what I want to ask here first. Um, so I guess what I want to know is, do you think that it's all right to have a feminist movement when men and women shouldn't be treated like opposites. Couldn't we just have a no more sexism movement? I mean, I think the feminist movement is a no, is the no more sexism movement. I mean, humanist, uh, you know, that is a separate philosophy. That's its own thing. And so you can argue that I mean, the term feminist is a bit of an anachronism because it originated in a time when um, sexism against women was much uh, more pernicious. It was more overt. Um, discrimination was overt. Uh, but, uh, you know, libertarianism is not a perfect term. Um, some people prefer classical liberal. Uh, you know, these, these terms are imperfect, but they're the best we have, and so... Like objectivism, which yeah. should be egoism. <laughs> exactly. And are you going to not use the term because it's imperfect? Like, no. Um, well, and I use the term because it's recognized, so I guess you may do the same thing. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, is it unfortunate? Like, I think people are just way too literal when they think, oh, because it's called feminism, because it was developed to fight against uh, misogyny directed at women, that it somehow means that women want to lord over men. That's incorrect. Um, again, you can find women who are like that. It's not representative of the movement. Just like you can find people who want to end the state because they want to be bigots and they, they want anti-discrimination laws struck down because they want to be able to discriminate. Those people exist. They're not representative uh, and now, they should never be taken as such. Now, is the movement about trying to bring um, information to the public or is it about trying to force government to treat, to treat women more fairly? Because I'm against any government intervention at all, really. Sure. Like, I, I definitely don't want to try and force gender wage gap sure. to close. I don't, I don't want to do any of that. Yeah, no, me neither. Um, I've argued against the, any, any kind of anti-discrimination laws um, and pay fairness laws. I think that they're, uh, you know, legislation is blunt and always has unintended consequences, besides which I just, I want to see the state ended. Um, there are different schools of thought within feminism, just like there are within libertarianism. Some libertarians want to see the state completely ended. Some want to see the state maintained but shrunk. Um, within feminism, you have Marxist feminists. You have, uh, you know, Republican feminists, not very many. Um, and then what you have is a really cool strain of thought um, known as uh, libertarian feminism and individualist feminism. And both of those kinds of feminism respect free markets and kind of take the idea uh, of individual sovereignty and apply it to women and recognize where the state and where sexism violates women's individual sovereignty and seeks private cultural solutions first, um, but then also 
they're interested in shrinking the state in such a way that it stops oppressing women particularly. And there are so many ways that the state does particularly uh, oppress women that there's absolutely a role for a kind of libertarianism and a kind of feminism to mm -hmm. identify those areas. Can you give us at least one example? Of oh yeah, I'll give you a few. Um, and these are all things that I've written about in Reason Magazine recently. So, you know, we keep talking about rape culture and whether it exists um, and the campus rape crisis and what's to be done about it. Well, government created the campus rape crisis. It used to be that whether you were raped on campus or off, you went to the police. And obviously, there are all kinds of problems with going the, to the police. The police do a horrible, horrible job of investigating rape. But college administrators, which is what rape victims are encouraged to, uh, well actually they, they have to, college administrators have to adjudicate rape cases on campus. And so it's like a victim doesn't want to go to the police and the administrators, so usually rape cases are only administer, uh, adjudicated by college administrators um, through federal law. Um, I think it was Title IX in the 1970s. Uh, they, they've just, they've botched it up horribly. And it takes pressure off of police departments to do their jobs properly. So no one's, no one's really inv investigating rape properly. Another example of the, way, the ways the state oppresses women is through um, immigration restrictions and uh, legislation and regulation around child care. Child care in 31 states is more expensive than college tuition right now. That is not the free market at work. That is insane. And obviously it's keeping women who might otherwise be getting careers not motivated to do so because it doesn't make financial sense. So, I mean, that's the war on women. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Um, by the way, did you know that Ayn Rand, uh, side comment, called herself a male chauvinist? Yeah. Yeah. Can a woman be a male chauvinist? Because seriously, I, this keeps being brought up, and I keep thinking about it, and I'm, I'm wondering how she... You know, because she never really explained why it was that she considered herself a male chauvinist. Can women be male chauvinists? You know, Ayn Rand is really fascinating because I think she encapsulates a lot of what kind of holds women's advancement back. And that is, I believe that through both culture and possibly even a little bit of biology, a lot of women and men really enjoy, and especially sexually enjoy, a certain kind of gender role performance. And I think that it, when you read Ayn Rand's books, she really, really got off on a certain conception of masculinity and femininity. And any kind of movement that would, or ideology or thinking that would challenge that gender role performance that they enjoy sexually, they oppose. Yeah, you know, I mean, she definitely watched one too many James Bond movies. She was a big James Bond fan. Um, but I think even more than that, um, I agree with you on a certain level. I've made comments about her um, views on women. She stated in one of her interviews that she would never vote for a woman president because no woman should be at the you know, higher than all men, and that would be emasculating for men. And I, I just really oppose that idea, the idea that she treat. I, I don't like that she treats men and women as different, especially when she's writing characters like Dagny Tiger. And see, this is the thing that throws me off is she writes these strong female characters that rock the world, and then as soon as, you know, they get to the bedroom, the male dominates. Right. And I don't understand why she has this view when there's no reason, A, to put a gender bias between people, and B, I, I mean, it's very unobjectivist to, to be gender biased. I, it, it's a philosophy of the individual. To say that men are more important than women is to take the individual and just crush it into a category. And that's not what objectivism is supposed to be about in the first place. So her... Her saying that was very unobjectivist, and, well, I mean, her view on the state is unobjectivist, too, but, I mean, we're just going to ignore that right now, and, because I'll get off on a whole tangent about it. <laughs> but the thing is, is that I oppose her view on women. Um, I oppose her views on men, 
And I think that when you ignore that, she has some great stuff. I think her philosophy is very sound, very, very good. But I think that she needed to tone down this thing. But, but also, I think it's important to also address that in her book, uh, The Fountainhead, she had a rape scene. Now, now I understand that a lot of people are really upset about this, and this is something that I want to talk to you about, Kathy, because I know that you've talked about the rape culture before. Now, um, it wasn't rape, and this is why. Um, there is a term in the BDSM culture called consensual non-consent. And it was very, very clear that Dominique wanted Rourke, that she wanted to be with him. She pursued him often. And um, it, was, it was an unspoken understanding. And if she really didn't want Rourke to have to be intimate with her, she wouldn't have invited him over. She wouldn't have pursued him in that way. And I think that it needs to be recognized that there is a such thing called consensual non-consent. And that in my view of this book, that is what's going on. My understanding of consensual non-consent, though, is that it requires at least explicit verbal and Preferably written. It normally does. It normally requires very explicit verbal contract and pre-negotiation and all of those other things. I mean, I can't get into Ayn Rand's head, um, and especially these characters' heads, and we, we simply can't know without knowledge of this contract. So without that knowledge, I would presume non-consent. Um, I, I think that that's just... You know, it's it sounds bad when you're like, well, I, she was asking it for it. Like, it I knew that she bad. really actually wanted it, even though her mouth was saying no. Like, well, she invited me in. Like, police officers have said, have said that. Oh, did you go into his room? Okay, it wasn't rape. Well, hell fucking no. Like, that's not, <laughs> that's not how this well, works. No, 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 that's, that's not what I'm saying. She yeah. pursued him at the Grand Quarry day after day. She was very clear about it. And afterwards, there was no... I mean, that, that was the real thing, was that afterwards there was no talk of, you know, she didn't want it or any psychological drama. It was very clear that she was very happy with the situation afterwards. So I, mean, I would say just based on Dominique's reaction afterwards, I would say it was a case of consensual non-consent, which many people are into. And I really don't see a problem with, with BDSM play or any of that. I think that people should um, pursue their highest values, and if that's one of the things that you value, you should look for somebody else that values it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those things where clear communication is key. Um, we need to be very okay with the fact that a lot of women have rape fantasies, and that's like a totally normal, like, good thing. It does not mean they want to be raped. It means they want to play this out. They want to have consensual non-consent. They want to say, hey, you, I want you to play like you're raping me, and these are the limits that we're going to put in, and this is what we're going to talk about. And it's weird. Like, people are not cool with admitting that, and it, it's stigmatized. And I think that that leads to a lot of miscommunication, where it's like, well, you know, uh, is she into it? Is she not? Like, let's just talk about it. Do you really, I mean, do you really think there are a lot of women that have rape fantasies? I mean, I've seen polling. Like anonymized polling that said that like a really, a really surprising large percentage. Yeah. Huh. Well, and my first show we talk about rape fantasies. <laughs> Bring <laughs> me on, <laughs> baby. Um, polyamory, morality of sex. <laughs> we can just keep yeah. going all day, can we, Kathy? Um, <laughs> I think so. But yeah, you're kind of my person for this. I mean, this is this is what we enjoy talking about. When, when we talk. Um, and so I I I, I want to reiterate this hashtag and Father's Day. Because it's good to be able to talk to you about it. It's good to know that it was just it wasn't the feminist movement, it was the MRAs and it was their their underbody, under like like low base culture. Um, 
that is not the majority, and that's really good because, I mean, I think that celebrating Mother's Day and Father's Day is a little arbitrary, but overall, if people want to do it and people want to find a day to honor that, then that's great. But personally, A, I don't see a value in Father's Day just because I think, first of all, you should um, honor the people in your life more often than one day, and B, just because he's your father doesn't mean that you honor him. So I think that I don't. I just don't like Father's Day for that reason. Um, Mother's Day as well. So, um, but that's me personally. Where are you on that? I think it's fine. Um, I, I think that it's really interesting. Amanda Marcotte, which writes, you know, I've actually debated her in Talking Points and Memo. She's a big feminist writer on, um, uh, what was it, revenge porn. She thinks it should be illegal. I think it should be legal. Um, but anyway, she wrote a thing about uh, not valuing fathers and how oftentimes, because feminists support a woman's uh, ability to to parent on her own, A, if that's what she chooses, and B, if that's just the situation in which she finds herself. Um, a lot of people castigate single mothers. They say they're evil, and they blame them for a lot of things. And feminists say, you know, single mothers do already have it hard. Social stigma is really not helping, so could you stop? Um, but a lot of times, uh, single mothers and feminists are accused of not valuing fathers. Uh, trying, you know, They're accused of trying to separate children from their fathers and you know putting down the role of fathers in a child's life I think that that's a really gross misinterpretation of the situation making life easier for single mothers uh, does not mean putting down fathers it doesn't mean that fathers aren't important I personally think both from my own personal life my father was very very is very very involved and from the literature I support fatherhood 100 percent. I don't think it should be compulsory, um, but and I don't think that you you know you can still have a happy, good life and be a, a great person if your father is not involved. But uh, I think it's great if he is, and I think that's wonderful. And so that's another kind of misconception of feminism that I kind of want to clear up that that they would be somehow opposed to fatherhood. I think that that's that's incorrect. Yeah, based on what you've described feminism to be, I, like I said, I haven't done enough research for us to be able to have that debate today, but we are going to have that debate, Kathy. We are going okay. to talk about feminism. It's going to be a thing. <laughs> um, and we're going to do probably like two hours and talk about it because I have a feeling it's huge. There's a lot to talk about, and I think that um, my audience has been wanting to hear me talk about it, especially since I said I wasn't going to talk about it. But you know, <laughs> since I met you and have started talking to you, I've come to terms with the fact that I should probably talk about it. <laughs> and, um, so we're going to go ahead and do that eventually here, and uh, we'll set up a time for that. But um, I th there was a point I was going to make, and I was... That I got feminism it. or fatherhood or single mothers? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so, um, so I am, even though I've, I've said I'm not really that into Father's Day, I do call my dad pretty frequently and, you know, I'm like, I love you and, you know, I want you to know that you're important in my life and all that, you know, sappy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but ultimately, I am going to get my dad something for Father's Day. I found him a cool new toolbox. What are, you, what are you getting him, Kathy? I'm going to get my dad a Cracker Barrel gift certificate. Oh, that's really cool. Your dad likes Cracker Barrel? <laughs> he loves Cracker Barrel, like, a lot. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So are you going to get that gift certificate with Bitcoin? I, maybe if they have the option. I have a little bit. But it's a little bit valuable right now, so I kind of want to hold it. <laughs> Actually, no. Um, it's been dropping. The Bitcoin oh, really? is going way down. It's like majorly plummeting. Okay. Um, I'm about to release a new video in which I oppose um, calling U.S. currency money because it's an insult to Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 what do you think? You think uh, ferns are? Oh, oh. By the way, ferns are FRNs, which is Federal Reserve note, which is U.S. currency. Just okay. so my audience knows, but we call them ferns out here because we're <laughs> we're cool in the Free State Project. But um, Kathy, what do, what do you think? Is 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 that money? I mean, 
Ferns? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> then that's all we have to say about that. <laughs> um, so we have about five minutes. Is there anything else you want to discuss or anything you wanted to cover, Kathy? I would just, you know, I really want to challenge the libertarian community especially. I mean everyone, but I obviously care about libertarians a lot. Um, this is going to sound a little bit conspiratorial, and I haven't really ever... <laughs> Warning. I've never articulated this before, so exclusive. Um, but I was reading, a, again, a Salon article, because I, I like to do that. And uh, it was talking about, and there was a lot in it that I disagreed with, but it was talking about the, this guy surveyed like 100,000 uh, white nationalists. And uh, he was describing a, an insight that I thought was really interesting, which is that... Uh, Middle, middle and lower class America, especially men, have been really screwed uh, in the modern economy. And the way that it's kind of manifesting itself is that the small businesses that these men's fathers owned and the farms that their fathers worked on, they're not viable options for them going forward. The factories that their fathers worked at, these are all going away. They, you know, they've pretty much gone away. Um, the small businesses have been eaten up with corporatism and regulation. The oh, right. small yeah. farms have been bought up by massive cronyist agribusiness. Um, the factories have been, you know, shut down through globalism um, and and trade agreements that are not good for the American worker. But the people at the top aren't interested in, you know, these men realizing what's been done to them. They're not interested in being identified as the enemy. And so we have a situation in which uh, things like, um, you know, uh, affirmative action and any kind of idea of reparations, um, you know, welfare and feminism have all been identified by these men as the enemy in a way that gets people at the low end of the totem pole fighting each other instead of the power. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot like um, people, I, I guess, you know, I don't, uh, there's moments that I don't like the Occupy movement, but overall, I think what they were doing had a very good message. I think that um, the fact that they were actually pointing at those Wall Street people and saying, look, they're the, they're the people putting all this money into government to do all these horrible things to other businesses and lobbying to keep themselves on top and all this and exposing all this cronyism, I really applaud the movement for that. Um, I don't agree with some of their personal political views, but at least they were pointing that out. And I think that um, that's that a great insight. That's a great if, insight. If there was what? any central message to that movement, it was that. What, what, and the way I would articulate that is what Occupy did is they pointed their anger upward. Right. And that's right. And what, where we mess up is when we point our anger to the side and down. Right. Those okay. people aren't doing it. They're not your enemies. They don't have any power. Your anger needs to go up because those are the people that are oppressing you and me, okay. and that person that you're mad at, that they want you to be mad at. We're all being oppressed by the people who have the power. Focus on that. So, Kathy, uh, we are at the end of our half an hour, so can you tell us where we can find you? Absolutely. I am at kathyreisenwitz.com. That is C-A-T-H-Y-R-E-I-S-E-N-W-I-T-Z. I am on Twitter at, at Kathy Reisenwitz, and I am on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Kathy Reisowitz. Thank you so much for having me on, Lauren. This is a really sure. fascinating discussion. <laughs> and make sure that you guys tune in each week at 6 p.m. on Friday. This will be replaying on Friday on the Voluntary Virtues Network. This will be the Objectivist Girl live show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, hopefully we'll be talking about to Kathy about uh, feminism very soon. Remember, guys, knowledge is not for all men, but for those who seek it. So keep seeking.